This video is sponsored by NordVPN. We Mandalore take everything we are and throw it into battle. It's the true test of yourself. A battle against death. Against oblivion. One helmeted bounty hunter that looked unbelievably cool has spawned an entire mythology within this bigger mythology. This is a good character. People like the bad guys. Well, and George Boba really Fett's borrowed cool, Boba Fett from, from Man With No Name, because yeah. if you think about it, it still has that sort of breakdown of Eastwood's uh, straight yes. brim, yes. Hel yes. Uh, brim <laughs> like that. Just kind of old, older in the eyes. And yeah. the poncho. Alive or dead, it's your choice. beautiful simplicity yet really underlying complex characterizations that you get in them. Definitely there's a Star Wars vibe to any of them. As long as I get paid. I always follow my job through. So through that I learned about the Western, through that I learned about samurai films. <laughs> I want to be influenced so much by Star Wars, but I want to be influenced by the stuff that influenced George. All the great myths, the primitive myths, the great stories have to be regenerated if they're going to have any impact. Fantasy has no bounds. What you can do here with the new technologies is simply extraordinary. It's truly an adventure, a Star Wars adventure. Five months out from their film's theatrical debut, the crew of the very first Iron Man kicked off 2008 at George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch in Marin County, California, home of the greatest post-production facilities in the world. In between reviews of the film's sound mixing, writer, director, producer, and actor Jon Favreau would tour the ranch in his spare time and rediscover every bit of the legendary sci-fi franchise that gave the ranch its name and that he loved as a kid. A love that would inspire his career turn to filmmaking and his own take on Marvel Comics' Iron Man. In weeks' time, Favreau would soon also find himself right down the street at Big Rock Ranch, the headquarters of Lucas's new animation division, where supervising director Dave Filoni gave Favreau and his son a special glimpse at what would become George Lucas's final production. For generations, my ancestors fought proudly as warriors against the Jedi. Now, that woman tarnishes the very name Mandalorian. Star Wars The Clone Wars and Favreau's fan favorite character Pre Vizsla would only be the beginning of a beautiful creative friendship between Favreau and Filoni. One that would leave a lasting impression for years to come, even as he went off to helm the live-action remakes of Jungle Book and Lion King, two of the most innovative productions in Walt Disney Pictures history for their use of video game engine technology and VR to shoot in a virtual environment. In many ways, Favreau embodied a bit of the pioneering spirit of George Lucas, someone invested in the kind of film technologies that could change the industry forever and that didn't go unnoticed by Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy, who reached out to Favreau on September 25th, 2017, as the ideal candidate to kickstart Disney's new streaming platform with the first ever live action Star Wars series. She knew Favreau would flourish with the storytelling tools offered by Lucasfilm. All she needed was his pitch. So Favreau looked back 
through not just the Clone Wars, or the many films he already made for Disney in his career, but the Star Wars he grew up with, the films he loved watching with his father, and the stories that carried him through the untimely death of his mother, and gave Kennedy a name as synonymous with legend as it was with obscurity. And now, Boba Fett, Star Wars villain with his laser rifle. Boba Fett is not yet available in stores, but you can get him free with four proofs of purchase from any Star Wars action figures. Not exactly Boba Fett, but everything that made his generation obsessed with him. The bounty hunter covered head to toe in colorful armor, a cool edged killer with the walk and talk of a cowboy, and the character who was an action figure before he was, well, a character. Yet, for every kid with his action figure in the audience of The Empire Strikes Back, a film that told you next to nothing about Boba Fett, that only made him more interesting. In concept artist Joe Johnston's original artwork, Boba Fett was described as a super commando, and only later on would George Lucas coin him with the term Mandalorian. Evil warriors defeated by the Jedi Knights during the Clone Wars. Or at least, that's how it went. Writers and fans told their own stories of Boba Fett and the fabled Mandalorians for years to come, but the biggest boom came in 2002, with the introduction of Jango Fett and Attack of the Clones, followed by Bioware's Knights of the Old Republic a year later. I will add your head to those of the other Jedi I have killed, and take yet another lightsaber for my own. Before long, there were books, comics, fan films, and official language even, and Fandalorians, an entire pocket of the Star Wars fandom with their own colorful Mandalorian armors. Eventually, George Lucas and Dave Filoni brought these elements into the Clone Wars, with the conflict between the pacifistic new Mandalorians and tradition-bound Death Watch. The Mandalorian stories of the Clone Wars remain not just its highlight, but some of the greatest stories ever told in the franchise. <laughs> For Favreau, the legacy of Boba Fett and the Mandalorians represented the most fascinating and untapped area of the Star Wars mythos in live action. And having worked as an usher at his local movie theater during the opening weekend of Return of the Jedi as a teenager, a post-Return of the Jedi Star Wars galaxy seemed like the right place to explore it. Nearing the end of production on Star Wars Rebels, Dave Filoni, producer Carrie Beck, and writer Christopher Yost were brought in to meet Favreau and help take his pitch to the next level. As two friends reunited, the Mandalorian was born. More than Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon, there were two elements buried deep in the Star Wars DNA that Favreau wanted to pull into the foreground of The Mandalorian. The samurai film, <laughs> and the western. In the time of his early career, few western directors so devoutly loved the Jedi Jiki, meaning period drama, and yes, that's where Jedi comes from or the Chanbara, a subgenre of Jedi Jiki meaning sword fighting, more than George Lucas. The works of legendary director Akira Kurosawa, like The Hidden Fortress or Yojimbo, dearly inspired his approach to narrative and framing on Star Wars, while Kurosawa's go-to collaborator Toshiro Mifune was a blueprint for the wise and powerful Ben Kenobi. On the other hand, spaghetti westerns like Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West, or The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, influenced much of the world and grid of Star Wars, while Clint Eastwood's laconic Man with No Name was a cited influence on Jeremy Bullock's mysterious Boba Fett. He's no good to me dead. Favreau loved both of these genres, but what most attracted him to them was more than just following in Lucas's footsteps. It was the reason Sergio Leone so ably put together what many critics would call a shot-for-shot -shot remake of Yojimbo with 1964's A Fistful of Dollars. It was the times of relative peace and uncertain change in post-war eras that both genres depicted, through Japan's Edo period and America's Reconstruction era. And it was the lens through which both genres viewed their stories, in the eyes of the American cowboy and the wandering samurai. Cinematically, the knight errants of two geographically disparate cultures. 
where American literary fiction leading up to the 20th century romanticized the sweeping vistas, manifest destiny, and tough as nails outlaws signature to the Wild West, especially in the tall tales of Davy Crockett, Buffalo Bill Cody, and Doc Holliday, the Western genre itself wouldn't come to be defined until decades later, with films like John Ford's Stagecoach and Henry King's Jesse James. Classic westerns, where upstanding gunfighters, often played by John Wayne or Henry Fonda, would defend the downtrodden, oppose corrupt lawmen, and conquer all manner of wild, untamed nature on the frontier. Inspired by the iconic outlaws of the western, directors like Kurosawa and Hiroshi Inagaki led a Jedi Jiki renaissance in Japan where films like Seven Samurai, Chushingura, or The Tale of Zatoichi depicted samurai not in their prime amidst Japan's bloody age of civil war, but after the war and during the Tokugawa dynasty of wandering ronins, or masterless samurai. And then finally, in turn, samurai cinema inspired Italian directors like Leone and Sergio Corbucci to twist the moralistic outlook of both genres into the morally muddy backdrop of the spaghetti western. Playing into a greater subversion of the Western genre in America, the revisionist Western. Though what they depicted was rooted in reality, these genres, the Jedi Jiki and the Western, would flourish into mythologies for Japan and for America. Cinematic folklore of mythic characters infused with the values of justice, cunning, and bravery, or respect, nobility, and self-sacrifice. The same sort of values illustrated in Joseph Campbell's monomyth, and subsequently, Star Wars. A contemporary storytelling canvas that has only grown more mythological in spirit with each new entry into its canon. For the Star Wars story he was about to tell, Favreau wanted to take all of these elements and meld them into a setting that wasn't just influenced by the Western or Jedi Jiki mythology, but was a tapestry for them. A lawless outer rim, where gunslingers, bandits, ex-soldiers, and ronins alike, along with all the age-old tales that follow them, practically run amok. The Galactic Civil War is over, and the Empire's all but finished, yet the newly established Republic hasn't yet secured its foothold, resulting in an unruly landscape that resembles something of the Edo period or Reconstruction era, a time as susceptible to change as it is to stagnation. Director of photography Greg Frazier and cinematographer Baz Idowin capture this feeling throughout the show's first season with the open stage, the iconic western landscape, what film critic Dave Kerr describes as a blank page to be written on, the promise of something new. There is some law to the land, like the Bounty Hunters Guild. No pucks for you, now get out of here. But otherwise, as we'll glean from a decaying Mos Eisley, stormtroopers cowering from the public eye, a cantina run by droids, or even the Kuwaitian monkey lizard, once in the court of decadent huts, to now the spit roast, is that the natural order of things has been turned upside down. There's no Star War to be nobly fought, and no Luke's, Hans, or Leia's in sight. Only a galaxy that doesn't quite know what's next on its plate. Yet, for a few lone gunfighters, it's in this chaos that they find order. The Mandalorian, like the Boba Fett before him, is a bounty hunter. As cold and unforgiving as the landscape that isolates him from the show's very first frames, and relentlessly efficient in his trade. To quote Ben Kenobi, he may be more machine than man. Few things face him, and far fewer can draw their gun faster. We have you four to one. I like those odds. From the T visor of his helmet, resembling the brim of a hat, to his economical use of dialogue, Mando immediately invokes the Eastwood gunslinger of stoicism and lawlessness, especially when set against a galaxy of characters Favreau wrote to be particularly verbose. If you've never seen a fledgling Mithral evacuate the thorax, you're a lucky guy, trust me. He may not ride a horse, but the steel gray ship he flies is no less an extension of himself. Mechanical, durable, and dangerous.
At the same time, the real man behind The Mandalorian, Pedro Pascal, was directed most explicitly to internalize Mifune Sanjuro from Yojimbo. Mando isn't just a gunslinger, but a warrior, pledged to a strict code of honor and tradition, much like the samurai Bushido, to an underground clan of fellow Mandalorians headed by the aptly named Armorer. This is the way. Mandalorians are rewarded in the glory of battle, reflected in their coveted Beskar armor, effectively the samurai armor of Star Wars, just as the Armorer's Forge evokes the ancient tradition of Japanese steel swordsmithing. There are many edicts to the life of a Mandalorian, but one rule stands above all. Never take off your helmet. To do so might be an even greater dishonor than the removal of a samurai's topknot. Altogether, Mando is Favreau's samurai gunslinger, a figure more mythic than human, utterly indiscernible from the symbols, code, and tradition he's sworn his everything to. Yet, something more lurks behind the silver dome of his helmet, a one-way mirror to the mind of a mystery, more angular and oozing with menace than even the helmet of Boba Fett, a quiet suggestion that, perhaps, Mando needs this order for it may very well keep at bay ineffable chaos. A lone wolf, always at motion, always running from the mechanized demons of a deeply traumatic past. If he ever stops to face them, he'll be as helpless as the little boy he was then. But if he finds order, a system that ensures his demons, or anyone for that matter, will never catch up to him, he can be ruthless. He can be a hunter. This is the core conflict for the Mandalorian as much as it was for the Edo Ronin or American gunfighter. Law versus lawlessness and order versus chaos. Like all the stock genre figures that surround him, from the bartender to the rancher or the banditos, Mando is content living his life exactly as it is, never breaking from the myth and never deviating from a perfectly endless loop. Favreau, on the other hand, is not interested in that. What Favreau wants from the Mandalorian is not necessarily a cunning anti-hero or a devout warrior. He wants something more than that. He wants Mando to find something, or someone, that can break his cycle of control. It won't be Nick Nolte's quill, though he's but the first and wisest of many faces who will guide Mando forward. Instead, it's the one thing that he can't repel against, what he can't point a gun to, True to the violent, lonely path that's long molded him, what Mando will find is actually the very thing he's been running from all this time. A little baby Yoda. No less helpless than the fractured child deep down inside him. The fractured child, he still is. Mando made a choice, and it's going to turn his whole world upside down. With the little green raisin now joined at his hip, our protagonist is no more the Mandalorian with no name than he is the lone wolf and cub. Very much of the wildly popular manga, film, and TV franchise of Japan in the 1970s and 80s, where the fearsome ronin and assassin for hire Ogami Ito wandered Edo Japan with his infant son Daigoro in a baby stroller. Lone Wolf and Cub found success for a multitude of reasons, but its most compelling ideas were rooted in the foil between Ito and Daigoro, the conflict that arose between pursuing vengeance and being a father. 
In The Mandalorian, the foil of the child complicates everything for Mando pretty much immediately. He's harassed by hunters, his ship is stripped apart by Jawas, and despite their puny disposition, they practically hand his ass to him. Mando was reluctant to tame the Blurg, but he's even more reluctant to ask for Quill's help, to subside his lone wolf nature. The child throws Mando's entire sense of order for a loop, and he doesn't like it. Positively absurd measures will be needed to retain it, and both Favreau and director Rick Famuyiwa capitalize on that in every moment of chapter 2. From a heated alliance with Jawas, to a mud-caked brawl with the unmatched Mudhorn. All the while, Mando is increasingly unwilling to loosen any more of his grip on the rigid order he desperately needs. He'll even die in the name of it, bested in honorable, albeit humiliating battle by a superior foe. But he doesn't. Instead, he witnesses something beyond his wildest imagination. A feat capable of shattering anyone's fragile notion of the universe. Something that can't be unseen. If there was a word to describe it, whatever it was, it might only be fate. A force to once again suggest that the Mandalorian's order is not meant to be kept, but broken. For one reason or another, the universe has linked Mando with the child. He can cling to the familiar validation of his warrior ways as much as he wants. He can even use its spoils to reclaim his lost order. A suit of armor strong enough to hide the gaping emotional insecurities his previous suit apparently could not. But by the same token he acquired this armor because of Baby Yoda, fate might ordain it to serve another purpose contrary to his hunter ways, yet entirely befitting of them, to shield that little green raisin from everything he could not shield from his younger self. He made a choice in sparing the child, but now a different kind of choice lies before him, a choice thrust upon one generation's hero to the next. Moreover, for the galaxy trotting journey that, unbeknownst to Mando, surely lies ahead, the beginning of an odyssey. Like Odysseus himself and the Greek poet Homer's epic poems, Mando will trek where few souls, and even fewer Mandalorians, have gone before. Through unforgiving badlands, tangled swamps, and frozen wastes, deadly trials of cunning and bravery, and the crossroads of legends to myth themselves. It won't lead home, for Mando yet knows no such a place, but it does lead somewhere, and it will take a long, long time to get there, testing his bond with his newfound creature every step of the way. How can one be a coward if one chooses this way of life? This is A Gunslinger's Odyssey. This is the way. This is the way. Stranger, can I help you? I've been quested to watch a list of movies and shows that are only available on streaming services in other countries. 
If I can somehow connect to those countries while maintaining a safe and reliable internet connection, I can clear my watch list for good. <laughs> Why, that should be no trouble at all, provided you have NordVPN. Nord... VPN? What is it? Only the best VPN service around, allowing you to connect almost anywhere and browse the web securely, all while hiding your IP address from public networks. What else can it do? Well, it can stop companies from collecting all your online data, and with Nord CyberSec technology, it can block ads and dangerous malware too. How could I acquire NordVPN? Oh, it's simple. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash Artor, and just for you, stranger, enter the code Artor at checkout, and you'll have a huge discount on a two-year plan. The link to this limited time offer is in the description below. Thank you. I should probably keep moving. My pleasure. Safe travels, my friend. Cameras started rolling on Chapter 1 of Huckleberry, the internal codename for The Mandalorian, on October 1st, 2018, coming after just nine months of meticulous pre-production. In other words, for a Lucasfilm production of this caliber, a very tight schedule. Compared to a typical Star Wars film, The Mandalorian would have half the budget, but double the runtime. And according to Lucasfilm Vice President and Production Designer Doug Chang, the art department had but a third of their usual time to make designs. Yet, through both the guidance and creative partnership between Favreau and Filoni, work that should have been impossible became manageable. As Favreau and Filoni pitched story ideas for each episode, Filoni would sketch out key visuals for the art department just as he did in his seasonal story meetings with Lucas on the Clone Wars, expediting the initial design process considerably. Designs were approved in only two or three rounds, and occasionally, right from the first iteration. Favreau knew exactly what he wanted from every aspect of the show, yet relied on every artist's work to inspire the final touches of each script. A collaboration akin to Lucas's directing style of the Star Wars saga. However, in front of the camera, the same free-flowing style of collaboration would be a lot more difficult. Even with a formidable budget of 15 million per episode, Favreau and Filoni dealt with the constraints of the TV medium. Sets would need to be cost-efficiently built, reused, and repurposed wherever possible, as would costumes and props from former Star's productions, like Rogue One, be reused and modified for the show. Even then, a staggering amount of either VFX work or location shooting would be unavoidable, and both could be costly. Favreau didn't just need one of the best crews in the TV industry, he needed technology that didn't exist yet. Technology that not only Favreau had worked to pioneer on the digital playgrounds of Jungle Book and Lion King, but DP Greg Frazier on the set of Rogue One. That's what led Favreau, Frazier, and visual effects supervisor Richard Bluff, after many months of experimenting, to invent one of the most revolutionary film technologies over the last two decades, the ILM Stagecraft, or as the crew called it, the volume. We have put together a system whereby which we can have game engine, real-time render, and video wall technology coming together to create a backdrop for the big, beautiful world of Star Wars. It feels like a real three-dimensional environment surrounding you because it is a three-dimensional environment. Because of the volume, the VFX pipeline that's been traditionally used in the film industry over the last several decades was now flipped. Most visual effects are instead created in pre-production rather than post and implemented in Epic Games' Unreal Engine. And yes, it's that Epic Games. There's still some VFX work to be done in post-production, but what's there and camera at the start could be adjusted on the fly, allowed actors to give better performances with their surroundings, and didn't require the endless compositing of green or blue reflections from a highly reflective main character, a luxury C-3PO did not benefit from in the prequels. Well, it couldn't possibly be as bad as all that. In some ways, the volume serves as a fitting, full-circle evolution to the early days of the Western. Where the matte background once provided illusory Western scenery, the volume projects a photorealistic environment. It's just one of the many ways The Mandalorian, and pretty much everyone involved in it, was trying to push the TV medium forward. 
just like the show's approach to previs, or previsualization, a commonplace practice for high budget action movies, but once again, not in the way Favreau wanted to use it. Unusually, Favreau's team of episodic directors were brought in well before their days of shooting to work with VFX and the editorial team to previs the entirety of their respective episodes. For Taika Waititi, Deborah Chow, and Bryce Dallas Howard, this process allowed them to make conscious decisions about their episodes early on, producing a blueprint for each department to follow, including ILM's volume. For Rick Famuyiwa, motion capture and stunt work could be rehearsed well in advance and used in previs to craft the perfect action sequence. And for Dave Filoni, this process was right at home with his experience in animation, where every episode was traditionally assembled first in previs, and in the case of The Clone Wars, exclusively in previs, without any storyboards. It's a pipeline that has more in common with animation than live action, and pulled just about every department closer together in unison. On a recorder in his I never bathtub. Got, I never got a recorder that's that good. In the woods. <laughs> in the woods. Even to Ludwig Gornson, frequent collaborator of Ryan Coogler and Childish Gambino, The Mandalorian was an opportunity to push the Star Wars sound forward with a genre bending score, mashing the orchestral elements of John Williams together with the electric guitars and spaghetti western fare of Ennio Morricone and the influences of hip hop. It's an element that seems like it would never work in Star Wars, but it does. Capturing the same sort of cross-cultural fusion anime fans might recognize from Nujabez's hip-hop-inspired score from Samurai Champloo, or RZA's similarly genre-bending score for Ghost Dog, The Way of the Samurai. Both projects are token demonstrations of the odd, many intersections between hip-hop and samurai culture in modern media where a newer underground sound is juxtaposed with traditional Japanese culture to ultimately deconstruct the dominant structures and ideas of the samurai. For Gornson, this type of sound challenged the dominant musical canon of Star Wars as much as it did the Mandalorian himself, always represented by a lone bass recorder, despite how many genre clashing sounds surround him. Gorenson's music is one of the many ways the audience is permitted to infer the emotions of an emotionally complicated protagonist, alongside the careful physical performance of Pedro Pascal and his two doubles, grandson of Western icon John Wayne, Brendan Wayne, and martial artist Latif Crowder, where even their smallest gestures mean something of a character imbued with stillness or Fraser and Idowin's deliberate camera composition and movement with the editorial team's attention to shot length and age-old techniques like the Kushlov effect, yes, that one from your freshman film class, to attribute emotion to a faceless character. This concerted approach was invaluable in forging the bond between Mando and Baby Yoda in the first few episodes, but it's especially necessary through the middle chapters of season one, as Mando is set loose on a distant frontier. Wish I knew what you were From Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, or John Sturge's American remake The Magnificent Seven, if you will, in Sanctuary. Then, to Filoni's ode to the young and old gunslinger team-up of the Western, particularly Sam Peckinpah's TV series The Westerner with The Gunslinger. And then, to an utterly Star Wars take on the tried-and-true ragtag heist plot with The Prisoner. In another sense, Mando is lost in the Star Wars mythology itself, crossing paths with all the delightfully rubber-masked figures and obscure characters often relegated to the background. The Rebel Trooper, the Imperial Sniper, the Devaronian, or the Shuttle Bay Mechanic. In addition to the Ugnaught, IG Droid, and Battle for Endor Blurg, he already met. And it's something quite peculiar. 
something that's shimmering and white. All the while, we are never lost with Mando himself. Despite the show's predilection for an episodic approach, more akin to shows like The Westerner or Wanted, Dead or Alive than the prestige drama series of the streaming age, there is always an emphasis on Mando. He knows his life has been changed and some of his order relinquished, but that won't stop him from carrying on as if it hasn't, from clinging to the ordinary world he's afraid to leave. Even if that only confronts him with the ex-dropper and lost soul of Cara Dune, and a local community of krill farmers who've lost their peace to Clantunian raiders, Mando, and in part Dune, are trying to stay in one kind of place, in an environment they can control. But fate just won't let them do that. Instead, they're being pushed forward. Towards what isn't clear, though it's certainly not more order. And so, they must put aside their lone wolf ways and give a community the tools to fight back. Even after the smoke has cleared and peace has returned to the farmers, being part of a community that accommodates for his needs as much as he accommodates for theirs is not something Mando's trauma permits him to have. He still won't take his armor off, literally and figuratively, and because he never had this stability growing up, he'd rather give it to the child, even if doing so would only hand down his abandonment. He'll get over it. We all do. No matter his decision, Mando and the child must remain on the move, heading where he and the Ronin gunfighters he embodies have always been welcome to go. A landscape as befitting of outlaws as it is of the lonely past he longs for. But Mando won't quite find what he's looking for there either. In the time that's passed, the mercenaries that have hunted down Mando only regurgitate the same detached drivel he once told his targets. I can bring you in warm, or I can bring you in cold. The shoe isn't just on Mando's other foot. Mando is changing, revealed to us in the shadows of the former selves that hound him. And none may represent that better than Toro Calican. You can keep the money, all of it. I just need this job to get into the guild. Toro initially seems harmless, if not just a bit green behind the ears. However, in Filoni's words, he understands gunslinging from pulp novels, but he doesn't understand the reality of it, that it's a real job. Toro is the Mandalorian without his code of honor, someone who greedily vies only for personal glory and gain regardless of what it takes to achieve it. He is what Mando was looking for in Tatooine, but not what he expected. The cold-blooded hunter, indifferent to the universe around him. Inevitably, Toro only shows him the futility of going back to that. There's no more glory in the hunt for him. He has greater concerns, greater responsibilities now, and it's only at the wrong moment that that becomes abundantly clear. You would be foolish to challenge any Mandalorian, but Mando most of all. Not because he's the deadlier killer, but because he's much more than that. In Hangar 3-5, Mando decides, for the first time, that the child isn't to be given away and certainly not to be sold. That child is his. <laughs> And yet, that won't stop Mando from trying one last time to retreat to something, anything, that'll restore his sense of control. But Mando's most desperate stop 
is a blurry one introduced in congested close-ups, showing us how unfamiliar Mando's grown with the crime world he once knew. Not with the optics he has now, anyway. And somehow, this retreat might be his biggest mistake yet. Hello, Mando. Mando is partnered with the lowest of lowlifes we've met so far, his irrational, selfish, and delusional former gangmates. Even with the helmet on, Mando's body language around them reads of immense discomfort. They haven't changed one bit from their days of running jobs, but according to them, neither has Mando. And coming from these guys, that's a scary accusation. But then in the Republic prison, we see an odd line of morality we haven't seen before. Where Mando once disintegrated Jaw was without second thought, or encased his targets in carbonites with the candor of a horror movie villain, he now refuses to pull the trigger, to be the gunslinger. Mando may not realize it, but he's developing a conscience, a capacity for empathy he's never had before. And to no one's surprise but his own, it costs him even more betrayal. <laughs> Though the underworld's no place for a conscience, it's also beneath a man of Mando's resilience. Because it'll take far more than a jail cell to keep him from his child. <laughs> By the end of Mando's short-lived retreat, the good old days are gone. Despite what he might say, sarcastically or not. Though Mando has found himself in almost every predicament out of necessity to survive a brutal paycheck to paycheck lifestyle with a reticle on his head, the truth that's been shown to him is irrefutable. He's just not the same tough guy he used to be. I told you that was a bad idea. He's out of place wherever he goes, and at odds with just about everyone he might have once called an ally. Everyone, except the child. To an extent, he's resisted the hero's journey, clutching to the ordinary at every opportunity. And though it hasn't stopped him from who he's becoming, it has enabled him to suppress the deepest, darkest part of himself. The fear that defined his lone wolf nature in the first place. Nevertheless, the journey so far has wearied Mando of some things. Carl Weathers' grief karga extends a truce to Mando and invites him back to the guild, back to just a little bit of his lost order. However, the Imperial Remnant is also there in force and will need to be dealt with to clear his bounty for good. If it's to be a battle of law versus lawlessness, then Mando may just need a magnificent seven of his own give or take a few members. Production on The Mandalorian's first season lasted about four months, from October to February 2019. Most episodes were shot concurrently, including Filoni, Chow, and Watiti's episode set on Navarro, while the last episode to be shot was actually The Gunslinger. All throughout the overlapping schedule, each director covered second unit on another director's episode. Effectively, The Mandalorian is the product of a shared vision between several directors, disguised as a purely episodic experience. This directorial band of mercs, as Favreau described them, was the basis for Mando's own band of mercs in The Reckoning. The tough-as-nails, heavy-hitting Cara Dune and gentle, nurturing Quill might seem worlds apart in every conceivable way for Mando. Heck, they even fought for opposing sides of the war, but they've all, Mando included, walked the same rugged path in isolation, adrift and without cause. They've enjoyed their time out on the frontier, but Mando will extend to them a bit of what he found on his own. Something worth fighting for. They just need to take the difficult and treacherous step of counting on each other 
as much as they've counted on themselves. In The Art of the Mandalorian, Phil Sostak writes, The Mandalorian is, both in front of and behind the camera, a broadening of perspective, exploring a lesser known but still vital thread in the rich fabric of Star Wars. For the crew behind the camera, the revolutionary workflow of the volume certainly broadened their perspective, but it's these two chapters on Navarro that allow that sentiment to fully bear fruit before the camera. In Qui-Gon's words, there's always a bigger fish, and that's no less true of what awaits our heroes. The hapless stormtroopers wallowing in Navarro's storehouses suggested early on that the Imperial Remnant couldn't be weaker, but the startlingly formidable and very well-armed garrison reinforced to the town proves entirely otherwise. The tide of the law is stronger than any part of the galaxy has led on, raised in opposition to an equal tide of chaos. Conversely, we've never traversed Navarro from its interminable lava flats, an open stage hidden from sight. It is the backdrop of an arduous journey and a wild frontier, but remember also, it's the promise of something new. As Quill's once imposing blurgs are carried away by monsters like mice, another kind of perspective broadens for Grief Karga. Molded by a world of outlaws, of deception, distrust, and gunslinging, Grief receives the last thing he'd ever expect from anyone. Compassion. The child heals him, without hesitation, without regard for who Grief really is. And just as that's left an unmissable impact on Mando, it'll convict Grief in a similarly lasting way. The miraculous kindness of a child didn't just bring these four outlaws together. It may be the first and only thing to ever give Grief a spine. The chance to consider what Mando has been considering since he first laid eyes on the child. Now, liberating Navarro won't just be about the possibility of freedom, but that's something new we've been teased from the very beginning. Redemption. However triumphant these gunfighters hope to be, Favreau and Chow won't let them go before the offer of a vile devil's advocate, a bigger fish than the client. A man with no honor and no respect for his agreements or his men. He is the archetypal lawman, but against an unraveling outlaw like Mando, his villainy runs deeper. The war that heralded this lawless time, it never ended for him. Instead, the past and all the trauma that goes with it, that keeps people like Mando on foot, is his playground. And it's completely under his control. You have something I want. You may think you have some idea of what you are in possession of, but you do not. Giancarlo Esposito's Moff Gideon embodies everything Mando could spiral into. The violence he might eventually carry out to restore the sense of control he's desperately lacking. The past glory he'll cling on to just to have it. And the honor he'll willfully disavow to pursue such ignoble goals. In the pantheon of Star Wars villains, he shares the same refusal to let go as figures like Vader or Maul. And to Mando, he cuts to the core of his mysterious facade. Where Din Djarin has been reluctant to broaden his perspective, Gideon refuses altogether, because he believes he already knows everything. Just as you betrayed our business arrangement, I would gladly break any promise and watch you die in my hand. Surviving the trial of Moff Gideon won't just take guns. 
which for the record, it will take a lot of guns, but the capacity to resist what Gideon represents. Our heroes can't keep looking over their shoulder. They have to find the means to look forward, the means to accept what they can't control and the duty thrust upon them. Grief found it in finally showing his spine, Kara finds it in fighting Imperials, and Quill finds it in engineering something not for war, but for good. For Din Djarin, the means to look forward is right in front of him as much as it is behind him. And whether it was an astromech, a battle droid, a protocol droid, or an IG unit, he's met each and every one of them with the same hostility reinforced by his past. And for a man who's predicated his entire survival on moving fast enough to avoid a confrontation with it, IG-11's reprogramming hardly strikes him any differently. As he's resisted the uncertain implications of change in his own life, Mando stubbornly refuses the same of a droid. To accept otherwise would be to upheave the whole foundation of his being. It would be as if he died that very day. Do it. Do what? Just get it over with. But on a day every bit as fiery and bleak as then, where his fate was first sealed behind two Mandalorian chest plate shaped doors, Din opens them. He lets his guard down. And instead of it scarring him, it heals him. Face to face with his own mortal enemy, Din begins to see himself. Mando spent years trading his humanity to embody the very thing he feared most. The only thing he could become to ensure he would never hurt that much again. But then came the little guy and all the chaos that came with him. The child is Din's means to look forward, and the duty thrust upon him is to be his father. This is the way. A father. Someone capable of defending the defenseless, looking after their needs, and leading them to their people. How does anyone prepare themselves for that? In these regards, IG-11 not only reflects who Mando's been, but who he now needs to be. What are you doing? Self-sacrificing. Willing to plunge himself into harm's way at a moment's notice. For if a machine can change, so can Din Djarin. All he needs to do is finally accept the nudge of fate and move forward. Our heroes survived Gideon's trial because they adapted. The age of lawlessness won't be forever, and times are bound to change. But that doesn't mean the Empire has to come with that change. There is a balance, out there, somewhere, between order and chaos. Grief and Kara might find theirs on Navarro, but Manda will need to venture so much farther to find his. As Den pays his respects to the cowboy that first showed him the way, a new chapter begins in what has become a never-ending journey. No matter how weary he is with the trail behind him, the Mandalorian looks to the horizon wider than ever before and keeps going.
Pre-production on Huckleberry Season 2 had fired up even before the end of Season 1's production, in January of 2019. With a much better grasp of the volume, Favreau and Filoni based much more of their story around pushing its limits, physically, technically, and narratively. The volume was rebuilt and reconfigured both for lower light scenarios and more dynamic backdrops. Favreau, Filoni, and Famuyiwa kept their script simple and gave season 2's directors, new and old, more hands-on freedom than ever. The difference, right from the first episode, is unquestionably felt. Though The Mandalorian was still rooted to its grounded western feel, the mythic spectacle it would soon bring to the TV screen would be larger than life. Favreau's first round in the Mandalorian director chair would be to tell its tallest tale yet. After crossing paths and throwing hands with the Star Wars Cyclops, Mando ventures beyond the Tatooine we know to the forgotten town of Mos Pelgo, straight out of High Plains Drifter. Partnered with Timothy Oliphant's Cobb Vanth, the Marshal, derived from the Marshals of Western filmography, like Henry Fonda's Simon Fry, these two knights in somewhat shining armor unite the indigenous Tuscans and people of Mos Pelgo to slay a fearsome dragon. While Vanth himself is an intersection between many Star Wars legends, Fett's armor, Anakin's pod racer, and Chuck Wendig's aftermath novel, the Krayt Dragon is practically a legend to the Star Wars canon itself. Baz Idowin's imagery invokes Lawrence of Arabia, Dune, and even a bit of Jaws, while Favreau delivers arguably the single most thrilling set piece in Star Wars since the Trench Run, a battle that cements the glory of the Mandalorian himself. I won't get to get what I'm after till the day I die. As Mando rides off into the sunset, the definitive visual of the Western, Chapter 9 certifies the rich and mystical backdrop of the Mandalorian where Western, Eastern, and Star Wars myth come to life and endure forever. Except it doesn't. Chapter 9 opened with Mando stepping foot where we've never seen him before. A darker, dangerous, civilized world. The antithesis to the open stage, wherein the law has already run its course. Later on, Mando will find himself not in outlaw havens, but places like Trask, Corvus, and under Greece renovation, Navarro. Well-oiled communities that have moved on, or tried to move on with the times. And though the New Republic's foothold is still but a shadow of their former government, even they will exert oversight where there was once chaos. The Empire's prior feud over Navarro was an omen, and the opening scene of Chapter 9 only solidifies it. The Wild West is ending. The storybook landscape, where the embellished myths of gunslingers and samurai-like could roam, is beginning to close. And the myth itself is dwindling. And part of why it's dwindling is tied to why it was initially thriving. The parallel between a post-war Star Wars galaxy and both Reconstruction America and Edo Japan. Entering the 1960s and 70s, the American culture that once embraced the cowboy, the idealized self-image of America's free-thinking, gun-toting justice, was starting to grow out of the Western. As the US became further and further embroiled in a morally muddy Cold War, one that would come to redefine how many Americans saw their government and themselves, the image of the cowboy changed. They were no longer the Ringo Kid or Wyatt Earp, but Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They were the Wild Bunch. They were the Stranger. They were all a dying breed, living on the very edge of America's progressive era either unwanted by society or trapped in one that couldn't be saved. Technology, modernization, and lawful reform stamped them out as much as it stamped out the wild frontier. As such, most westerns set during this period end in tragedy. 
And after more than 50 years of defining, redefining, reinventing, and remaking the Western over and over, audiences largely lost interest in the cowboy. Samurai cinema never died out in quite the same way, but it did lose its prominence, and for some of the same reasons. Overexposure, aging stars of the genre, the decline of the Japanese film industry, and the changing self-image of Japan. An image again defined by modernization, as Japanese society was reeling further and further from World War II and becoming increasingly tied to Western trade through the Cold War. Invariably, films like Harakiri, Samurai Assassin, or Lady Snowblood were either set in the waning days of the Edo era or critiqued the feudal traditions the Japanese self-image was growing further and further from. Many westerns have been made since the 70s and today, like Unforgiven or 310 to Yuma, as have samurai films like The Twilight Samurai and Lee Sang the Second's remake of Unforgiven, but not without heavily referencing or commenting on the cinematic periods that precede them. In The Mandalorian, a similar unraveling of myth is taking place, in spite of every evidence to the contrary. Like the gunfighter or Ronin, Mandalorians are becoming fewer and farther between. The first one Mando does encounter isn't a Mandalorian at all. It's Cobb Vanth, who practically pawned Fett's legendary Beskar from Tatooine's unscrupulous dumpster divers. And despite the sacred creed significance Mando associates with the armor, Vanth also makes a compelling argument for why he's earned it. Not for attack, but for defending his people. Cobb Vanth challenges Din's Mandalorian identity, the most integral, deeply rooted part of his internal sense of order, even more so than his past trauma. Mando has already sacrificed a lot of that order to look after the child, but to ask a Mandalorian to sacrifice being Mandalorian? That's too much. In fact, he'll double down on it, conveyed not in the lone bass recorder Gornson usually plays Mando's theme on, but the strong and confident sound of the electric guitar. For as Mando descends on a more civilized and industrialized galaxy, finding the strength to keep everything he holds dear close to the chest matters more than ever. But again, Mando is but one man in a clan of two. And he's bound for worse than getting lobbed off a speeder by bandits. The only way to ensure his survival is to keep following the ever-elusive force of fate. To take risks and surrender boundaries he never has before. And even then, survival is not assured. As Mando states early on, I'm not leaving my fate up to chance. Yet, taking that kind of chance is his best and only option when he goes to Tatooine in search of a true Mandalorian. Fate then gave him Vanth. And after hitchhiking it back to Mos Eisley, taking a chance is quite literally his only option once again. They'll tell you where to find some Mandalorians. That's what you wanted, right? To Mando, fate is now but one more thing to be fought, one more thing trying to strip him of his armor or his foundling. So he turns his nose up at it, believing the task of transporting Misty Roses' frog lady to be ridiculous and beneath him, not unlike Mando's stint with the Jawas back in Chapter 2. Unsurprisingly, it's not long before he's reminded how well that went for him last time, because the galaxy is rapidly changing. And Mando can't outrun fate any more than he can outrun the law. I don't know where he thinks he's going in that thing. Just as Mando's razor crest is an extension of himself, the means by which this ancient hunk of steel can outrun the order clamping down on it is pushed to the limit. Whether it's real, imagined, or something strangely in between, director Peyton Reed drops Din Djarin into something of a Star Wars nightmare. 
where our only company in a cave colder than Hoth are two characters costumed head to toe and a puppet. As the bleak odds of survival set in by the second, Mando is faced by his worst fear, the thought of losing all he keeps close to the chest. The Creed has always taught him that only the strongest should survive the elements thrown at them. If need be, only his clan of two should survive. But it's not enough to believe that, and it's not enough to sleep the nightmare away either. Wake up, Mandalorian! Din's identity is challenged again, and in the voice of the thing he used to fear, before it made him stronger, before Mando vowed to be self-sacrificing. But maybe now, that mantra doesn't just apply to protecting the child, maybe it applies everywhere. For if he's not willing to defend the last of Frog Lady's ancestral line, why should he deserve to defend the child, or his fading creed? I thought honoring one's word was a part of the Mandalorian code. I guess those are just stories for children. Mando can remain beneath the ice, be as cold and isolating as the wayward killer he once was, and die in shame with his mythic creed. Or he can confront his fear and put himself on the line to allow someone to survive. Because very soon, you will have to choose whether to put everything at risk or be consumed by fear. Reed crushes Mando as far into the corner as he'll go, by way of the most spider-crammed fever dream ever envisioned for Star Wars. Firing at the speed of the trigger finger, and fighting within inches of his life to defend Frog Lady and the child, Mando veers towards oblivion, the edge of extinction for two dying breeds, and says, no. No matter how ancient his ways, he won't die beneath the ice. He won't die the cold-blooded machine he once was. He won't be the last Mandalorian. because the nightmare is over. For facing his fears, fate seemingly rewards Mando with Republic salvation. His good deeds earned him mercy, almost as if to tell him he's on the right path. The old Razor Crest is reliable enough to make it to space, but like Mando, its days have never been more numbered. Come up here, I need your hands. And though Mando escaped his nightmare, he'll have to face all his fears, all over again, on Trask. By now, Mando is wearing at the seams. The crest has been pummeled about as much as any ship can be, Mando's armor does little to protect him, and the only warriors who are capable of rescuing him, the Mandalorians he's been dying to find, will be the last people he'd ever call Mandalorian. I was hoping that... No one obstructs Mando's sense of identity more than Katie Sackhoff's Bo-Katan and her Night Owls. Lifelong Mandalorians, who, to the myths of the Clone Wars and Rebels, might just be more Mandalorian than Din himself. Where Din once felt empowered to be part of a proud, spanning creed, he's now a wayward zealot, abducted by a cult and effectively sheltered to the outside world from behind a suit of armor. Mando might push back, try to unhear what he's heard, but he won't succeed. Again, fate gave him what he asked for, but not what he wanted. Next to them, he's effectively a polished relic, a stranger.
Is it not enough to follow the creed? To belong to something that gives you purpose and meaning, only for it to be undercut everywhere you turn? Should Din not fight to protect what Mandalorian means to him? Maybe. Then again, he does need Bo-Katan. Mando's quest could end here. He could pretend the Night Owls aren't Mandalorian and maintain the increasingly fragile order that his creed brings him. Or he could open his mind. Director Bryce Dallas Howard's Mandalorian action is cutthroat and filled with character. From the choreography to the framing, even to Sackoff's body language and to Gorenson's synth blown score, there's a surgical precision to the way the Night Owls fight, like a well oiled machine, one more adapted to the times than the fossil failing to keep up with them. Though they are newer and faster, some of their tactics might border on dishonor. Bo-Katan wields fear like a weapon, like a Mandalorian Batman, using it to further her goals and her goals alone, even to the point that she's willing to violate her agreements. Mando can accept that she's Mandalorian, but he won't stand to believe that she can't have a bit more chivalry. Though, on the contrary, Mando is the myth out of time. This is the way. more antiquated and isolated in his beliefs than anyone else. There's no reason for Bo-Katan to listen to him any more than there's a reason for Mano to accept who she is. So while Din may not have a say in what does or doesn't make a Mandalorian, he does have a say in what kind of Mandalorian he will be. 8,000! Cover me. Someone willing to take on their fears and put everything on the line. Not because of what he'll gain, but what it'll give others. Take the Foundling to the city of Kaladin on the forest planet of Corvus. There you will find Ahsoka Tano. Tell her you were sent by bo -Katan. And thank you. She packed my bags last night, we fly. This is the way. Zero hour, 9 From one dried up town to another sea salty dock. Everywhere Mando goes, the faces and names he's crossed are settling into their own kind of order. To Mos Pelgo or Navarro, Mando is the one giving the gift of that order, fertilizing the soil for the roots of change to grow. But just as everyone is finding their own order, adapting their own code for the times, Mando is losing his. Even after bending to the forces of change and opening his mind as far as any person reasonably can, the circumstances thrust upon him demand more. With every stop, he has less and less to give, but still finds himself forced to risk everything all over again. For as important as this quest is to him, he'd never show it. But it's plain to see in our own reflection on Mando's hollow exterior. He's tired. The mythical Wild West really is ending, and with it, all the myths it once held true. 
Mando is but a gunslinger whose time has tragically run short. His only options now are to die with the myth his creed, code, and armor embody, or find some way to move forward again. Incidentally, fate has armed him with almost everything he needs to refind the way. Everything, except the two people who can put all the pieces together. If there's anybody in the whole galaxy who knows the power of perseverance, it's gotta be Ahsoka Tano. In 1971, Dr. No director Terence Young teamed up with French producer Robert Dorfman to shoot the first ever self-proclaimed East Meets West spaghetti western, Red Sun, in which western movie star Charles Bronson teamed up with samurai cinema icon Toshiro Mifune to recover an ancient samurai weapon that will restore honor to Mifune's Kuroda. Red Sun was one of the last big blockbusters in the golden age of westerns, and a long overdue intercultural and cinematic celebration of two mythological heroes that have always been more alike than different. Fifty years later, Star Wars had a Red Sun of its own in Chapter 13, The Jedi, where two sworn enemies, the Jedi Sorceress and Mandalorian Super Commando, come toe to toe on the wooded foothills of Corvus. Where the western myth has run dry across most of the galaxy, Corvus stands as an unwavering bastion of the Jedi Jiki mythology. It proliferates every inch of the planet, but every aspect of the episode as well. The iconic landscape of burnt tree stalks, the slow and focused camera movements, the constant wind, the feudal lord, the feudal peasants, Gorenson's understated score, and even the predominantly Asian cast. If we didn't know Ahsoka, she might as well be the resident ronin of any and every samurai tale, feuding the same dynamics of power over and over again like she's on the stage of a play. Filonian Eidoin's imagery often frames her as if she's one with nature, one with the old world at odds with modernization, while Mando of course paces back and forth against it. At the same time, from what the Star Wars mythos has to say about Ahsoka, she's anything but living in the past. In fact, Ahsoka is a survivor. Someone who's adapted their code from one period of change to the next, all to stay on the righteous path. She has the compassion and selflessness of a Jedi, but none of the dogma or inflexibility that blinded the creed she once swore allegiance to. And though she spent much of her life wondering, it's never been to run from her fears, but to follow her destiny, the ultimate manifestation of fate. Mando has long looked for Ahsoka so the child can finally have a home, but thematically, Mando has been led here because of what exactly she will illuminate for him. The potential of a Jedi's power, her devotion to the mystical force, and seasoned perspective will all surely expand Mando's awareness of the universe even further. However, Ahsoka's greatest power, and what Din greatly stands to gain from coming here, is her innate ability to listen. Grogu and I can feel each other's thoughts. Grogu? Mando would have always needed a Jedi to know the child's name, Grogu. But only through a person like Ahsoka could Mando fully understand what it means to look after him. Only through a lens as open as hers could Mando understand that it's never been about what he wants for Grogu, so much as it's about what Grogu needs. For the one reason or another that they found each other, the two have formed a lasting bond, heartfully evoked in the imagery of a dad and his kid playing catch. Good job, good job kid. It's a beautiful thing, and it fills Mando with fatherly pride, but there is a duality to it. Should either of the two ever be faced with the fear of losing each other, that bond could become possessive. 
like Anakin Skywalker, who tried to control his attachments, those who brought order to Anakin's tumultuous life, for fear of losing them. And of all things Ahsoka knows, she might know that most of all. Beyond the Force and the dynamics of connection with others it embellishes, this duality can apply to any kind of connection. To material objects, to rigid beliefs, or even to an outdated creed. It's a foreign philosophy to Mando's salt of the earth ways, but it gives pause nonetheless. To not only be honorable and self-sacrificing, but to be, at all times, compassionate and open-minded. The greatest lesson Mando has learned so far. So while Ahsoka may be reluctant to train Grogu, she is willing to cut him a deal. <laughs> To see just how much Mando is willing to sacrifice to save the people of Kaladin. The staging ground for the ultimate samurai movie battle in Star Wars, where Filoni invokes Kurosawa's rich filmography more than any other Mandalorian episode has. While Ahsoka battles the Magistrate's machines, and then the Magistrate herself, played by Bruce Lee's goddaughter Diana Lee Inosanto, Filoni and editor Andrew Eisen cross-cut to Mando's tense duel with Tombstone's Michael Bean in the courtyard. In a sense, Yojimbo is happening in one room, while Leone's remake, A Fistful of Dollars, is in the other. It's brilliant infuses the Western and Jedi Jiki mythologies into one story. It is Red Sun, but it's also the Siege of Mandalore of Star Wars legend. A prophetic battle where two age-old enemies unite before it ends. A Mandalorian's intervention has restored order to one more place, while Mando himself has yet again only lost more of his. Mando's fated encounter with Ahsoka was never to assure him how he can finish his honorable quest, nor the audience how myth and tradition can survive the times, but how to make the most of his fatherly duty. Ahsoka knows Grogu is part of Mando's destiny, not hers, and so she points him not in the direction of the Mandalorian path he wants to follow, but the path he should follow, the path that Grogu needs to follow. Go to the planet Tython. Place Grogu on the seeing stone at the top of the mountain. Then what? Then Grogu may choose his path. Mando may have not appreciated it before, but now knowing Grogu better than he ever has, he finally will now. The responsibility of being a father matters more than anything, even devotion to his creed, should he be forced to choose between the two. But with that, if the day ever comes where Grogu's true path diverges from Mando's, he must be prepared to accept that. To not be possessive of their bond, but to willingly let go. It might be the hardest thing anyone can accept, especially for someone who's already let go of so many things since starting this journey, and especially for a parent. Thankfully, Mando isn't alone in that journey, though he's not quite reassured. Then again. There aren't many Jedi left. Jedi or Mandalorian, both are dying breeds, perhaps destined to be slowly swept away by the times, by a galaxy that doesn't need them anymore. The Jedi Jiki mythology may thrive on Corvus as much as the Western thrived on Tatooine, but how long before the day it doesn't, when perhaps the red sun will set? While there's no way to know for sure, Ahsoka proves that there might be a way to outlast it. Mando must adapt, and with that, his path leads to Tython, an ancient site of Jedi tradition, already forgotten by time. Maybe, in walking the ruins of the past, he will find the key to the future.
fatefully. While Grogu will decide his future on the Jedi Seeing Stone, director Robert Rodriguez will force Din Djarin to decide his in the scarred face of Tamar Morrison's Boba Fett. You can't get more ancient than the original Mandalorian with no name, the blueprint from whom all this mythology has sprawled. And yet, he might have more in common with Ahsoka than any other Mandalorian we've met. Fitting to the context of Favreau's commentary on myth, Boba has moved on from most of his monikers. The ruthless, no disintegrations bounty hunter of the original trilogy died in the pit of Carcoon. Audiences wouldn't know the full story until Boba's spin-off series a year later, but even in this series, Rodriguez permits us to glean a Boba Fett born anew. Let's all put down our weapons. Have a chat. There's no need for bloodshed. A man who is merciful, open-minded, and bound to a code of his own. Alongside Cobb Vanth and Bo-Katan, he tempers Din's notions of what a Mandalorian can be as far as they can go. For Boba has already endured the Odyssey Mando's on, already chewed out by fate, and already pushed to adapt beyond his limits. Din may scoff at his demands, but as he'll soon discover, Boba is no fading mercenary. He is the son of Jango Fett, in all but name, a Mandalorian. If Mando is a gunslinger, Boba needs to be a barbarian. In the tragedy, Rodriguez serves up a Fett who lives up to the violent legend. Where the Night Owls showed Mando precision, Boba shows him might. Though both found the fighting spirit necessary to outlast the Order of the Empire, Moff Gideon too has found a way of his own to outlast the band of mercs that outmatched him on Navarro. An evil Mando is all too familiar with, and every outlaw and ronin will grow desperate to avoid. The human inside was the final weakness to be solved. If the boot of modernization has manifested itself as anything in the Mandalorian, it's Gideon's Dark Troopers. Remorseless, unfeeling, killing machines. Like any relic of the past, there's little Mando can do but watch. Watch as his son is ripped from the path he sacrificed so much to put him on, and watch as the fragile steel he's fought tooth and nail to preserve is obliterated. Even after serving him with wall-to-wall -wall punishment all season, Favreau and Filoni still had the audacity to put Din Djarin through the tragedy. The day his worst fears finally came true and was whittled down to nothing. Nothing but his armor and the Beskar spear. Fate once gave him the armor to protect Grogu. Now, Fate's not only given him the holy weapon for a chivalrous rescue mission, but the two knights who would be willing to help him. But fate sometimes steps in to rescue the wretched. For as cruel as Din's punishment has been, it's only after hitting his absolute lowest point, here in the ruins of Tython, that Mando finally finds the necessary means to reforge his creed. A new code, malleable to everything he's been through, everyone he's met, and who he needs to be to rescue Grogu from the Empire's clutches. As the final leg of the Mandalorian's Odyssey begins, he'll just need to find the courage to decide what that code will be. Perhaps there will be no New Age Mandalore, no Great Mandalorian Crusade. Perhaps your people fought their last battle at Malachor V, and you have been dying ever since, a quiet death that will last centuries. Hunted by the thought of being the last of the Mandalorians. With nothing to offer but a debt of gratitude, Mando assembles a fellowship, comprised of allies and individuals motivated by selflessness and honor. 
With their help, Din will chart a path directly to the heart of Moff Gideon's Star Cruiser and take back Grogu. But before he can do that, he'll need the Imperial expertise of someone truly unorthodox. You know, for a second I thought you were this other guy. Writer and director Rick Famuyiwa brings Bill Burr's worse for wear Miggs Mayfeld back into the fold for the penultimate chapter of Mando's journey. A soldier turned gunfighter whose days of riding horses and robbing banks are pretty much over. Next to the high likes of Boba Fett, Fennec Shand, and the Mandalorian, he is effectively a nobody, with no purpose to serve but the advancement of our hero's quest. But therein lies the kind of unique perspective that comes with Mayfeld's lowly disposition. As someone whose life was ruled by order, before losing it all, in Mayfeld's eyes, Mando is merely one fall away from the exact same spot. He's been to the other side of Mando's fears, scarred by chaos, but enlightened in a way Mando yet has not. He took his armor off long ago and relinquished his insecurities, and with the optics that accompany that comes the kind of insight Mando is hesitant to hear. I'm just saying, somewhere someone in this galaxy is ruling and others are being ruled. I mean, look at your race. Do you really think all those people that died in wars fought by Mandalorians actually had a choice? So how are they any different than the Empire? Look, I'm just saying, we're all the same. Mayfeld believes that no matter what creed one swears an oath to, or the Emperor one pledges fealty to, everyone is fundamentally an individual, bound to a code that runs more personal than any law or order. It's a dose of reality Mando isn't quite ready to accept, even if his definition of Mandalorian has been stretched dizzyingly far. He may not hear it, but silently, he will open his eyes. Looking on at the survivors of tragedy on Morak, the survivor that is Mayfeld, and the image that literally reflects back on him in the same armor, the security, the feeling of invulnerability that order can bring, is rather false. Order like the Empire's only benefits those with the privilege to push it on others, while the chaos allotted by the lawless galaxy is a futile response. The Watch may have none of the dastardly intentions of the Empire, but in the right situation, as Mayfeld puts it, the Creed, nor even its most sacred rules, can account for what Din needs to do for a father rescuing his son. But as they have since the beginning, the Empire won't let Mando slip before offering one last devil's advocate, delivered in a bone-chilling performance by Richard Blake. In a galaxy prone to constant change, constant chaos, and no apparent force to defend the future, why forego order when that's exactly what's needed to survive? Why reject the Empire when they bring the comforting stability that allows one to feel safe? Because even if you're not, you'll still have died in the name of a worthy cause. Entire city gone in moments, along with everybody in it. We lost our whole division that day. Man, I was like five, ten thousand people. Yep. All heroes of the Empire. Yeah. From the right angle, where leaders like Valen Hess, Moff Gideon, or arguably the Armorer preside, there might be no greater cause worth dying for. But ask the former stormtrooper how it feels to be so expendable. Ask him how afraid and traumatized that made him, and how the Empire ultimately used that to control him, excused as a sacrifice for the greater good. Ask him if the alternative was any better for the fighters of Burn and Khan. You see, boys, everybody thinks they want freedom. But what they really want is order. The, Empire. the answer will be resistance. If the cowboy is going out, then it's going out guns blazing. Mayfeld draws a line of his own against evil in the mud of Morak. 
He may have seemed as self-interested as any other pirate or scoundrel before, but if he knew he had the chance to prevent untold devastation, the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent people, and the inadvertent passage of guilt and trauma to the next division of stormtroopers at the next burning con, he would never be able to live with himself. Eventually, there has to come a time when the outlaw stops running and takes a stand instead. need to sleep at night. Mando may have no greater aims than rescuing Grogu from the Empire, but the lesson Mayfeld teaches him applies all the same. Absolute order is frightening, and chaos creates a world of distrust. But somewhere in the chaotic, uncertain middle between law and lawlessness might be a way of life that frees you. A code in touch with the past, yet malleable to the future, driven by compassion and honor, and altogether balanced. Din may not know exactly what that looks like, but he now knows what it mustn't be. Enough, both of you! No matter how set in their beliefs Bo-Katan, Boba Fett, and Din Djarin have been, the time of civil unrest between Mandalorians must come to an end. Fractured by the coming and going of order and tradition well, well before the era of the lawless galaxy, the last of the Mandalorians were written a death sentence on the Night of a Thousand Tears. If they don't learn from the past and continue resorting to gatekeeping, tribalism, or outdated tradition, their final passage will be written by the Empire in their blood. The Mandalorians not only need to take a stand, they need to do as so many others have and finally move forward. To broaden their definition of Mandalorian as Din has learned to do. Again, no one, not even the Aris bo knows exactly what that looks like but they're willing to try. And that'll have to be enough. Because where they're going, the jaws of the lion's den, where the erasure of myth has never run higher, moving forward together has alike never mattered more. Only then might they finally know if the legacy of the Mandalorians will deserve to live on in the present or perish forever. The Fellowship's rescue mission begins as a one-way trip, paving the way for the Lone Wolf, represented once more by the bass recorder, to find his missing cub. As he did in the icy caves of Maldo Kreis, director Peyton Reed slowly but surely crushes our heroes into a corner, by way of the most terrifying robots you've seen since Wallace and Gromit. Orenson's music becomes violent and mechanical. It's the exact opposite of John Williams' orchestral melodies, the inelegant sound of modernization, pounding away with unhindered force and repetition until nothing remains of the past. For Mando, it's a losing battle against his cracked reflection, armored and soulless, the thing that's stronger than him and shows no restraint. His traditional hunter tools do next to nothing, and ingenuity alone only gets him so far. If the Dark Troopers were one jaw clamping down on Mando, Moff Gideon is the other. What he may lack in brawn or fighting strength, he has, as he's always had, an edge in manipulation. The Mandalorian's mythological Excalibur, the Darksaber, a powerful artifact that, if wielded, could unite all Mandalorians, rests between Gideon's fingertips. Not because the mythos of the weapon means anything to him at all, but because it gives him control over Bo-Katan, thoroughly blinded by the painful past incurred by the weapon. Though it means less to him than saving Grogu, Gideon knows all too well what Mando might really be looking for. This child is extremely gifted and has been blessed with rare properties that have the potential to bring order back to the galaxy. 
but Mando is done looking for order and he's done answering to his fears. All that still matters to him is keeping the child safe. And he'll draw a fierce line in the sand before anyone says otherwise. Wielding the reforged Beskar of Mandalorian armor, Din Djarin fights a battle not of Mandalorian glory, but of protecting Grogu. Gideon fights with zero grace and zero mastery, yet is hell-bent on taking Mando straight to his grave. Mando puts his life on the line one last time, and survives. And yet, Gideon still wins. Because Din wields the Darksaber, not Bo-Katan, where it was won by right of combat in Mandalorian tradition. Bo-Katan and Din have ignored tradition before, but the Darksaber will be the linchpin that decides just how convicted either of them truly are in their code. If Gideon is successful, and this is but one more rule to divide and isolate the Mandalorians, he might crush them for good. And if he's not, someone or something else is bound to do it instead. The Wild West is over. The time of gunslingers and samurai, of tradition and myth, is soon to be no more. The changing times and a sure devastation that will sweep away everything from the past will drag every cowboy and outlaw down with it all the same. The myth is destined to fade into oblivion. Or maybe it's destined for something else entirely. Where fate may have once resigned myth to the grave, fate was demanding something else entirely all along, a myth powerful enough to strike fear into those who would dare erase it. A legend. A Jedi. Someone capable of giving others hope that the myth is not gone for good. It is very much alive and waiting to be embraced. The myth will be faced with hardship, with change, neglect, and even erasure. Not every part of it will outlast that hardship. But like the balance Mando has learned to cultivate, the myth can evolve. It can change with the times and be the hope every generation needs in their own battle of good and evil. It can even save you. All you have to do is open the door. Jedi? I am. His name is Luke Skywalker, a Jedi, like his father before him, but more importantly, a friend, when these gunfighters needed one the most. This is it. This is what the Mandalorian was quested to find. A journey brokered by fate to the edge of oblivion prophesized in Mandalorian ballad. But for Din, it can no longer be as glamorous as that. Fate took everything from him. His stability, his belongings, his very way of life, 
and gave him so, so much more. His friends, a newfound perspective, and his son, Grogu, the child who turned his life upside down. The little green raisin that taught him to stop running from the past, to look beyond himself, and to grow. The creature that taught him how to be human. And now, with the end of his journey, comes the difficult choice nay even every Star Wars hero must face, but every mom and dad in the world as well. Letting go. Don't be afraid. Nothing could be more terrifying, but there's no better way to be free. With just a few small steps, Grogu passes from one myth to another. An amazing cross-generational moment where something new is welcomed with open arms into the fold of something symbolic and iconic, into the pantheon of Star Wars legend, but more so, the open arms of myth that can inspire and move us to be human all the same. May the Force be with you. The future of myth hangs in the balance, and will be determined by those called upon by fate to lead others onward. That future might remain uncertain as ever, but in the here and now, there is a certainty, and a beauty, to the legend of the Mandalorian who learned to take his armor off. A gunslinger's odyssey, where no matter how cold, guarded, selfish, and heartless anyone can be, the journey to become compassionate, open-minded, self-sacrificing, and vulnerable lies ahead of us all. All we have to do is take the journey. This is the way. After 10, 15 hours of sheer bliss, you're rewarded with a baby. <laughs> but bullshit, it's not a baby. It's a little old man dipped in 40 weight. <laughs> Don't you see? It's like Gandhi and Churchill had a child. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they handed him to me. We made contact. Father, son, son, father. He looked me right in the eye and pissed all over me. <laughs> and I realize I'm a father now. Child, you're so ambitious for the juvenile, but then if you're so smart, tell me why are you still so afraid? Mm -hmm. Where's the fire? You want to hurry about? You better cool it off before you burn it out. You've got so much to do and only so many hours in a day. Hey, hey, hey. you know the way. The truth is told You can get what you want Or you can just get all You're gonna kick off Before you even get halfway through When will you realize You know where it's for you The Mandalorian first premiered on November 12th, 2019 And ended its first season on December 27th just one day shy of a thousand mile road trip that, for my family and I, was months in the making. Literal hours after watching Din Djarin blast off into the unknown, would my mom and I be doing the exact same thing, albeit in a car that was way lamer than the Razor Crest, all the way down the US Eastern Seaboard to my tentative new home in Central Florida. The start of an all new chapter in my life, where all the tense relationships, broken dreams, and traumatic baggage I had come to associate with my home state would be far behind me. And though this was the start of a new chapter and a journey, it wouldn't be the one I anticipated. Right as I got a new job, settled into my new college, connected with relatives, and started making friends, the COVID-19 pandemic was declared. 
By the end of that March, I lost almost everything I had found for myself in Florida and found myself back behind the wheel of my lamer crest to drive a thousand miles back to my parents in Pennsylvania. Back to the job I was ready to leave behind, back to the room that felt more like a protective bunker than a space of comfort, and back to the people and places I was ready to leave behind. The rest of the year was spent, as it likely was for so many of us, adapting to the circumstances. Biding my time until I could hop back in a car and return to my real home in Florida. Before I knew it, The Mandalorian was back for its second season and continued the journey of Din Djarin, months after my own journey was cut short. What followed for the next eight weeks would strike me to the core. A story of tragically relatable proportions, as Din was whipped from one unexpected scenario to the next, culminating in an indelible moment of acceptance and growth. Just as I was beginning to realize that despite the many turns my year had taken, I was finally right where I needed to be all along. That despite all the things I tried to run from before, being forced to confront them head on ultimately allowed me to heal. And despite whatever opportunities I lost in Florida, I ended up finding so many more over the next year and a half in PA. And I don't think I could have found any of it without The Mandalorian. As The Things They Carried author Tim O'Brien puts it, stories can save us. Then after all our other needs are met, stories are the thing we need most in the world. It's fascinating and perhaps a bit silly that Star Wars, a franchise first and foremost for children, manages to be that story for me time and time again, but it's also not by mistake. When George Lucas finished his fourth draft of Star Wars in 1976, he wanted to tell a story that applied the timeless ideas of Joseph Campbell's monomyth to a distant but relatable space opera setting where childhood fantasy and age-old mythology bled together in a cross-cultural sandbox. He believed, as Campbell believed of cultures all over the world, that we all have a destiny. We can ignore it if we choose, but if we don't and we follow it instead, we'll discover what every generation gets the privilege to discover for themselves. A battle between fear and hope, the lifelong choice to be selfish or selfless, and giving something back to the greater whole of the universe. It's a grand adventure, and for most of us, it will be, but not in the way we might expect. Following your destiny isn't always blowing up Death Stars or learning the ways of the Force. Sometimes it's as down to earth as starting a business, building a home, going on a life-changing road trip, and especially raising a child. And whether or not a spiritual force is truly guiding us to set that child on the right path, the very journey of doing so is long and winding. One that will teach us lessons and change us in ways we can't possibly anticipate forever. To my mind, that's ultimately what's made The Mandalorian, the global phenomenon, and one of the biggest TV shows of all time that it is. It is the perpetual mystery of its lead character, the rule of cool, the familiar and appealing mythology well ingrained into our cultural psyche, and the world-stopping cuteness of Baby Yoda. But most of all, it's the unmistakable humanity that emerges in every single adventure, even if nary a human face can be spotted. It's when you have to drop your kid off at daycare, when you're working two jobs and barely making enough to get by, when the group project is going worse than you could even imagine, or when your car gets broken into, breaks down, or pretty much any car trouble you could possibly ever have. And of course, it's when your kid goes off to college and embarks on the journey to adulthood that you took all over again. Because even if I've never been a parent, guardian, or all that much of a mentor in my young life, I do know what it's like to be so roughed up by the world that I closed my mind and my heart so that nothing could hurt me ever again. But when the day finally came where I had the courage to let go of my fear and let go of the coldness inside me, the beautiful privilege to feel again was magic unto itself. 
to now look back on that journey, on the four times I've moved in the last two years, I find the same reassurance and genuine hope that many of us, including Jon Favreau himself, whose son started college on the heels of season two's production, have readily projected right onto the faceless, silver-plated guardian of the Mandalorian. For if we can believe in the possibility of change for someone like Din, who's to say we all can't change for the better as well? I guess inside of all of us, there's that hero that's on that journey and in search of and the connection to father and to the father at large, the greater father, you know? It's all part of like why it works and why we care. It's not about X-Wings, it's not about the things we decorate Star Wars in. It's important, it's part of the genius of it. But we soulfully react, like we don't just want an action movie, we want to feel uplifted. And, and Star Wars is an adventure that makes you feel good. What I like about it is it's, it is really saying there is a lot of hope out there, that we fundamentally want to be good people, that we can all be driven to do terrible things, but that we can persevere uh, through selfless actions. Helmed with the cutting edge tools and technology afforded by 45 odd years of innovation from George Lucas and beyond, Favreau, Filoni, and the galaxy sized casting crew of The Mandalorian weaved a myth that is as much a product of the westerns, Jedi Jiki, and Star Wars that comes before it as it is of the kinds of storytelling the world needs to hear today. Star Wars remains a worldwide obsession and an inspiration for the storytellers of tomorrow, but it's also greatly evolved from what it once was. And despite that evolution, the myths our world most gravitates towards today are not always those set in a galaxy far, far away, as they were for the audiences of 1977. Today, many of us look to myths like superheroes, men and women a cut above the rest, capable of taking on the massive, unsolvable issues our globalized culture can't always solve for itself. Some might be tired of superheroes, or see their popularity to the detriment of stories and myths they've pushed into the past. But as the person responsible for the single most important entry in the superhero genre, the kickoff film to the highest grossing movie franchise of all time, John Favreau knows a thing or two about the evolution of myth. The myth is designed for the kids that are coming of age. We enjoy the stories as adults, but really storytelling is about imparting the wisdom of the previous generations onto the children who are becoming adults and, and giving them a context for how to behave and, and how to learn the lessons of the past without, without making mistakes on their own. I mean, that's the hope, is that you could teach them how to avoid all the hardship but yet get garner all the wisdom. Though the past will always be set in stone, the story of the human race in the present and the future is always in motion. And for every generation inspired to peer into the myths of the past comes the opportunity to evaluate what can be learned as much as what should be left behind. The Western was a great American genre, the superhero flick of its days as much as they are the Western of today. But many Westerns also romanticized the emotionally damaged loner, glorified racism against Native Americans, featured only men in leadership roles, and cemented the gun as an immovable symbol of patriotic freedom. All ideas that leave an unmissable shadow on American culture today. Of course, what should and shouldn't outlast the past is something us stupid little humans might never agree on, but if there is any constant I dare say we should, it's the very inevitability of change. The change Din Djarin experiences in his own life, in his own time. That change is scary, and not always good. But for Din, resisting the change and believing he had every answer to the universe right from the start might have been worse for him than the change that was bad. As we all set off on our own hero's journey, where who we are and what we return with will be more than what we leave behind us, finding the courage to face change head on, and if need be, to adapt with it, is as important for us as it was for the riders of the dwindling open stage, the last of the samurai, and the generation that raised you into being.
If the popularity of The Mandalorian, let alone Disney's bottom dollar alone, is any indication, Star Wars is bound to be around for a while. And heck, The Mandalorian's story isn't even over yet. While Favreau and Filoni continue to explore a galaxy sandwiched between two trilogies over 30 years apart, the team of filmmakers they've disseminated across Lucasfilm, from Deborah Chow to Taika Waititi, are poised to shape the Star Wars mythology in ways we might not be able to imagine yet. It is certainly an exciting time to be a Star Wars fan, and I can't wait to talk with you all about it again. for <laughs> the bug <laughs> or the robot and he's like you're the Mandalorian oh. <laughs> you're staring at just a blue screen so tell us about working together and just using your imagination. Well, you need a little bit of that, yes, because we're not actually in a real ship. You only got something, actually you didn't even have a handle, I don't think, right? There we are. All that came in later, but anyway, you got to sort of go like this. <laughs> Should I try that again, George? <laughs> but then I thought about Clint Eastwood. I always thought, what would Clint Eastwood do? And he'd do nothing. <laughs> what a revelation when they realized that the Mandalorians were all New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah, <huh? laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the end of what has been a very long video, uh, the length of which I hope to never surpass with another video, knock on wood. Uh, your reward is this secret video message, I guess. Um, what can I say, guys? Thank you. Thank you a hundred times over for uh, supporting this video, for watching it all the way through to the end. Uh, it, it really does mean a lot uh, to... to you know, have something to say and then have an audience who wants to hear what you have to say. It's not something I take for granted at all. Um, this video was four months in the making, took me over 300 hours to do. There were ups and downs the whole way through. There were points where I didn't know if the video would uh, quite come together in certain areas or if I'd have to compromise in some significant way. But where we've landed by the end is something I'm very proud of. And my sincerest hope is that I, uh, you know, you've had a good time with this video and you connected with it in some way, whether you're someone who's watched me for the 10th time or this is your first time watching me, um, that you've had a two hours well spent. Uh, that being said, uh, you probably saw it on the screen a minute or two ago, but uh, we are now on Patreon, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, something I've wanted to do for a while now. Uh, I just didn't want to do it until it was the right time, but it is now, I think. Uh, you can go in the description below and find the link, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash presents, and uh, there are three different tiers with different rewards associated with them. Uh, one thing I can tell you, one highlight of the Patreon, 
that I'm looking forward to recording over the next few weeks are a series of behind the scenes commentaries for all of my previous videos. Uh, that includes the Clone Wars videos, that includes the Last of Us video, that includes this video, and that'll include any videos I do in the future. There'll be behind the scenes commentary for, I believe, the middle tier. I know behind the scenes commentary for a, a YouTube video doesn't sound like the most exciting thing in the world, uh, which I would probably agree with that, but, uh, you know, as I said before, these videos take many months to make, and uh, with this video especially, uh, there are a few stories to tell that I would love to share with you all over on Patreon. So consider supporting me there. Uh, any donations I receive will go towards uh, some more far off projects, but most chiefly, any support I receive on Patreon will go towards the next video, which of course is on Mass Effect 3. I've kept you guys waiting long enough for that video, and I apologize. This video had to come first, and uh, what I'll tell you is this, actually. Um, before I even wrote the script for this video, I actually wrote the script for the Mass Effect 3 video. Um, I'm going to revisit it sometime in the next two weeks and probably end up changing some things here and there. You know, that it happens when you haven't touched something in a while. You revisit it later on, you go, hmm. You know, I might edit that or edit that. Um, but what that should hopefully mean is that uh, the, the process of putting the video out has been expedited greatly by having a almost ready to go script. Uh, that, that really, that literally cuts the process of putting it out in half. Uh, so instead of having to wait three or four months, like the wait for this video was, it will be one or two months. So that's what I'm hoping and things could always go wrong, but, um, yeah. So support that project over on Patreon. And, uh, if nothing else, take this video as a demonstration of what you can expect, um, it, it, it will be it's going to be awesome it's it's going to be a really fun time so guys um with that all that being said thank you so much for watching one last time follow me on twitter at parks Harmon. follow me on instagram as parks Harmon. uh you can follow me on twitch twitch.tv forward slash cytor instead of artor uh i think this week uh i, I actually recently picked up the uh, ucs lego most Eisley cantina uh and i'm thinking i might build it on twitch it might be really fun to do uh, so, you know, feel free to follow, tune in, we can have fun building Legos together, or, you know, more, I'm the one building the Legos, but, uh, we'll have fun talking about it while I'm building it, sorry, uh, and, uh, other than that, thank you to all the content creators, um, who had music that I used in this video, uh, your talents brought something to this project that I could not have done on my own, it really does mean a lot, uh, and, as well. Thank you NordVPN for sponsoring this video one last time. Those guys are great. Uh, you can check out that offer in the description below once more. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for watching one last time, and I'll be seeing you all next time. Adios.